Take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalms 1. I want us to uh, understand this morning how to dwell together. So the Bible speaks to us about everything. The Bible speaks about every problem that we Holy Scripture filled with the wisdom, wealth of the knowledge of God. Instructions, instructions on how to live outside the church. Instructions on how to live inside your home, job, or wherever it is. Bible or the full knowledge of about your situation there. Take with me and let's read Psalms 133. Give me just a moment. I'm do it like this. Psalms 133. Title of the message: How to Dwell. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to go together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head of upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, under the his garments. The dew of Hermon, the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. There the Lord commanded the blessing and life for So Psalms 33 tells us three things about together in unity. One, it tells us the goodness of living together in unity. It tells us the source of living together in unity. It tells us the blessing. Psalm 31, 33, it's a, a song of ascent that David wrote. There's actually 15 ascent songs in the, in the book of Psalms. David wrote four of them, Psalms 133. Last of the four that he wrote, what an ascent psalm is, the song they sang when they went up to worship the Lord. So this is one of the songs they sang as they went up to worship the Lord. He says, Behold. Now when the Bible tells you behold, or when the Lord speaks and says behold, it means, it means uh, take notice, to be aware, because what follows that is going to be very, very important. So God wants us to take notice of what he's fixing to speak to us. Here he begins to declare the, the blessing. He said, how good and, and pleasant. So David draws our attention to something that is good and pleasant, and that is unity among the people of God. It's good because it reflects God's heart and purpose of unity among his people. As he also described in John 17, 20 through 23 in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. What is unity? Why is it important and how does it work? Well, first of all, unity, the word is yakod. It's a Hebrew word that, that means a unit. One unit, a unit. It means united. So, so it's important because it brings the blessings of God upon the people of God. Unity brings the blessing. Where there's disunity, the blessings are hindered. And God desires that there be unity, that the blessings will come because he commands the blessing. In John chapter 17, let's read verses 20 through 23. Jesus is praying in the garden before they take him captive and, and take him before Pilate and Herod. And he says in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word. That gets you down to you and I. Jesus is praying that, that people that would believe upon the word of the apostles, he was praying for the apostles, that God wouldn't take them out of the world, but keep them while they were in the world. And then he says, I'm not praying just for them, I'm praying for those that would believe upon the word the gospel that they would teach and preach. And that gospel has came down to you and I in this generation and in our time. 
And so we can look at this and say, you know what, our Savior prayed for us ever how many 2,000 some years ago, whatever it's been. And he prayed for the generations to come. And this is his prayer, that they all may be one. That is a unit. That's unity. That they may be one. As thou, Father, are in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. To be one, to be united in Christ with the Father. To, to have a union with him. To be one unit, to have a oneness there. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which you've given me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So he said, I desire that the people of God would be one with me as I am one with you, Father. To be united, to be one unit, to be one. I in them, Christ in the church, Christ in you. Actually, he says that in Colossians chapter 3, I believe. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I in them and thou in me. I'm in them, Lord, and you're in me. That they may be perfect in one. That they may be made perfect in one. Made perfect in Christ. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. It's always been the will of God that there would be unity, that there would be that one. And he uses that as an example that as Christ and the Father are one, that Christ is in the Father, the Father is in Christ, Christ wants to be in you, and he wants you to abide in him. Romans chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. He said, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one, that is in Christ, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. God desires that unity to be there. God never intended for the church to be separated. God never intended for division to be there. God never intended for, uh, for, th for there to be a separation between him and you or him and the church or any other such thing. He believed in unity. He believed in one, one with the Father, one with Christ, and one with another. The body of Christ is a unit made of different members, but, but, but the intention is to be one unit in Christ Jesus. To be one member. Many members, but we're one in Christ. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. It is, it is pleasant because it makes life together as God's people so much more enjoyable in seasons when constant bickering and conflict might dominate. Get that down into your relationship with your spouse. Do you like the bickering and the fussing and the fighting, or do you want peace and love and goodness? Right? How about you? I don't like the... Uh, God does not bless this unit. I want us to get a hope. God does not bless. He commands the blessing according to Psalm 133. When brethren dwell together in unity. Go to 1 Peter 3, 7. He doesn't bless where there's bickering and conflict. That dominates. He doesn't bless that because that's the wrong spirit. First Peter 3 and 7. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. Now he just talked, if you want to read, I'm not going to read all of it, but from verse 1 down through verse 6, he's talking about husbands and wives and how to dwell together. And then he says, you husbands dwell with them, who? Your wife. How according to knowledge. 
giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And listen, here's the point I want you to get. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Bickering and conflict hinders prayer. Contention and strife hinders your prayer life. You may not think it does, but it does. For the, that kind of confusion is in the midst of your heart or in the midst of relationships. It hinders prayer. What God wants us to have, now listen to me, folks. God wants us to have a unity because he wants us to understand me and my wife are heirs together of God's grace and the life that he offers. And we as brethren are heirs together of the life of God. Heirs together. We are inheriting the same life. We're inheriting the same blessings. We're inheriting the same goodness of God. God doesn't want, God doesn't want division. He doesn't want separation. He wants unity. He wants a oneness. goes on and he begins to give some instruction. Finally, be you all of one mind, unity, having compassion one on another. Love his brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. He's talking to the husbands and the wives. This can apply to everybody. How do you treat your spouse? Be compassionate. Love one another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Now listen to what he tells us. Instructions of what not to do. Not rendering evil for evil. Why? Because it hinders prayer. Railing for railing. Don't do that. To rail on your wife or to rail on your husband or to rail on a member of the body of Christ, it hinders the, the blessings of God and it will hinder your prayer. It hinders your prayer life. So much of the time we want to say, God, why aren't you answering my prayer? God's wanting to get some things right in our spirit. But contrawise, it's not evil for evil. It's not railing for railing, but rather blessing. Knowing that you, now listen to this, catch the language of it, that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. It's God's will to bless people. I hope we can get that today. God wants to bless you. Brother Rick stood up here and talked about how he began to tithe and how the blessing of God came into his home, into his life, by being obedient to what God wants. And God wants the same thing in everything of our life. How does he want me to be? If you rail on me, he doesn't want me to rail back. He wants me to bless, contrawise bless. So much of the time in heated arguments and quarrelings and such things as that, we want to stand justified in our, in our spirit that we acted in. Listen to me, folks. Even if you're right about something, the spirit that you operate in can be wrong. important sometimes let me finish reading this and then I'll get to my next thought here for he that will love life and see good days that's a promise of God this is something that the apostle Peter began to write do you love living life there's people that are depressed and they've been depressed for years because of what life has did to them and the dreams and the visions and the hope they had. It never turned out the way they had planned it and they're cast down and they're discouraged. But yet here, Peter said, can you love life? Can you love living your life for the Lord? Can you love being one with Jesus Christ? Can you love your life in the family of God? And be united as brethren and be one. You love life, want to see good days. What he tells you not to do. Refrain your tongue from evil. And your lips that they speak. He 
people to do for you to have. Don't undermine things and don't undermine any kind of authority that's in your life to try to get your way or your vision or your hope or something that you want to transpire to come. The underworkings is something that Satan does. Underworking and undermining is a work of Satan. What does God do? He's right up here and he speaks at us, doesn't he? He brings truth and he brings, he brings, he brings that which is true and that which is right. There's no crooked way with God. God's way is a straight way. And the promise of God here is, do you love life and want to see good days? Put away from you the deceitfulness and the cunning devices and the wicked ways of our minds trying to manipulate or control or to get things the way we want things to be. It doesn't matter where it's at. It can be out on your job. It can be anywhere. People do that in their home or with their loved ones. People do it in church. People do it out here with, the, uh, with people that they interact with. Let him shew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it or go after it. Follow it. Run after the peace of God. Let peace be between brothers and sisters. Friend and I had some uh, a lady and her husband. Had a twin sister right across the road that she spoken to. Because of a situation that and it created. And both of those women, I don't care what either one, it doesn't matter who's right here. Both of them were so pride they could I can't imagine that. My mind can't go down that road. I don't know how that works. And to have that enmity in your heart for, for your own sister that you grew up with that was a twin of yours. I mean, they grew up together. That you can't walk across the road and say, God doesn't, he wants, God, I believe God wants to bless us. Seek peace and sit for that. Now listen here. The eyes of the Lord are what? Over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. God wants to bless. But he's saying what? What I want you to understand, I want you to give blessing when people will rail on you, when they render evil for evil. Bless them because you've been called to something greater than that. And that is I want you to inherit a blessing. I want you to love life and I want you to see good days. But in order for that to happen, you're going to have to watch your tongue because because the, 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 uh, James said in the third chapter, the second chapter of James, he said the tongue is an unruly evil. The tongue is an unruly evil. You can harm, you can hurt, you can uh, uh, cast down, you can discourage, you can destroy with the words that you speak and with the hatefulness that comes out of the mouth of people in this day and time. They don't care who they destroy. You know what? It's because they don't under the they don't understand the spirit that is moving. Spirit of God. That way, His eye is over the righteous; His ears are open to their prayers. And the Lord is against those that do evil. How you treat people matters to God. We can we can say it doesn't matter. Listen, when you there's. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. I'm amazed at the attitude I find, especially on social media, and the things that are put there where they deserve that, they don't care. It's just a lot of drama that goes on there sometimes. I'm not saying with everybody, but it's there. And people posting things that they, about them or their family about their, that they probably should never post or make public. That's just David's opinion. I'm not getting on to nobody, so don't take it that way. We need to be careful whatever we do. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11. Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you all speak the same thing. 
that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together. There that word is, unity, joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared to me, brethren, by them which are the house of Colia, that there's contentions among you. I'm not saying it because I believe there's contentions among us. As far as to my knowledge, we don't have any. And I hope we don't. If we have, I'm not aware of it. But we want to we want to we want to be on guard and not allow ourselves to get caught up for Satan can begin to do things to destroy. Back to Psalms 133. Two. Here he begins to describe the blessing. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, went down to the skirts of his, his garment. Now for brethren to dwell together, David had in mind the relationship that God's people have one with another, not with the world around them. As believers, we should... We should work to do good and live and have and, and live as peaceable as we can in relationship with all others outside of us, according to Romans twelve and eighteen. He says, "There as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men." But inside, he's talking here in Psalm one thirty three, and here the focus is on our relationship among God's people, for brethren to dwell together in unity. So what does he mean when he talks about the ointment upon the head of Aaron? The anointing oil intended for the head. Now you can go to Exodus 29 and 7. I'll read it to you. Then thou shalt take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. But the oil wasn't just confined to the head, nor could its fragrance be contained. The oil that Aaron was anointed with, it was a spatial makeup. It, there were spatial ingredients in it, and it had a fragrance to it. In Exodus 29, 21, he said, You'll take the blood that is upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments. It was on his head and it was on his garments that it was to be sprinkled. Of his sons with him and it shall be hallowed. And his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with him. This oil hallowed or made holy Aaron and the garments that Aaron had on became holy through the anointing oil. Now this oil, was, it, wasn't, it was provided explicitly that the outpouring of the oil, or after the pouring of the oil on the head, some was sprinkled on the robes, and he and his garments are holy. Now running down on the beard of Aaron, the picture in word shows that unity is a rich and abundant blessing. And as oil overflows the head and came down the beard, it also shows that unity is rare and a precious blessing. Because the suggestion is that this was holy anointing oil. And it was not to be Im imitated. In Exodus 30, 22 through 23, he gives us the ingredients of the oil. I'm going to pick up and start reading in verse 31. And you shall speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be the holy anointing oil. Unto me throughout your generations, upon men's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Now, now give me just a moment here, church, because I, I want to bring something into focus here. In the Bible, what does oil represent most of the time? The Spirit of the living God. And he said this oil and the composition that it's made up, and it gave away a fragrance. There was a smell to it, a good smell. And they, they put it upon the head of Aaron, and they put it upon the garments of Aaron. And it flowed down on him. And when the oil was poured out upon him, Aaron became holy and his garments became holy. And when the son was, uh, when his sons was anointed and their garments was anointed, they became holy. And they went in and they represented the people. They went in and represented the people before the Lord when they offered sacrifice and burned incense before God. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Go 
going to read in first, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. What vocation? That you walk worthy of the vocation or the calling wherewith you are called. And then he begins to tell us how to walk worthy. With all lowliness. Lowliness means humility of mind. And meekness. This particular passage, it means gentleness and kindness. With long suffering, that means to be, that means to have forbearance, to be patient. Forbearing, that means to endure or to bear with or to stand up against. And what that means is, is regardless of what's happening, you're going to be patient and, 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 and forbear with them. I'm not a long phone person, I don't think, to talk on the phone. When we was pastoring the other church, I had an hour and a half drive when I had a certain sister whom we loved dearly get on the phone and call me without fail almost. She would talk, and she's one of these people that she talked and you talked. An hour and a half. Every once in a while I'd say, okay, uh, forbearance. That's a gospel truth you can hear. Forbearance. Patience. Because listen, all of us don't have the same personality. All of us don't have the same, the same uh, characteristics as far as what makes us who we are. But sometimes we got to be patient with people and forbear with people and their little things that they do or don't do or say or don't say. Folks, that wasn't just one time. That was every single. Where was I at in Ephesians? Forbearing one another, then he tells us how in love. Endeavoring, that means to pursue, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The word bond there means that which binds together. So what's going to bind us together is that we deal with each other in peace. In the love of the in the love of God, in the spirit, in the unity of the spirit, in the bond of peace, and it's the love of God that's going to bind us. Listen, that's why so many relationships fail in the world. And I'm not talking about just husband and wife, I'm talking about friends. I'm talking about I'm talking about with neighbors, with friends, with people, co-workers, with, with family members, your siblings, or whoever it is, between father and mother and mother and father. It's because relationships so much of the time is built on something other than love. Because what love simply does, it says, I'm going to serve you. It's going to be a sacrificial love, a servant love. And love is going to say, you know what? Sometimes you may do some things I may not like. Sometimes you may say something that might hurt my feelings. Sometimes you may do something that might make me want to go away and be by myself, or it might make you cry. Whatever it is, but the love of God is going to reach out and restore that relationship if they want it. If they don't want it, there's nothing you can do. So God never intended for two sisters to live across the road and not speak to each other for 30 years. There's a great breakdown, and then to go to church and say, I'm living my life for God, you can make whatever kind of judgment you want, but I'm going to say there's a fundamental breakdown in their thinking on how to live for God. That ain't right. I know sometimes you can't be friends with people. I get it. I've been. But don't let it be on your part. Don't let it be on your part. Pray for it. Help them. Because there's one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. There's one body. Not two or three. God only has one church. Amen? 
We only got one hope, and that hope lies in Jesus Christ and none other. That's where the hope lies. We've got one, and we've been called by who? By the Lord to live a different kind of life than the world is living, to have a different kind of spirit than what the spirit has, to have a different kind of walk than the world has out here. God changes people from the inside out. Listen, he's concerned about what's in you, what's abiding in you, what's living in you. The spirit that you're operating by has everything to do with what God is wanting to do. Go with me to Romans 5 real quick. Verse 1, therefore being, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, let me just throw this out there real quick because I can't do a, do a message on that. There's a, we've, we've talked about it before. How are you justified? That means you're made innocent by faith and faith alone. And that's what gives you peace through God. That, uh, what gives you peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How does it come? Faith in God. You're justified. Let's get that down in our hearts and our minds. That's the only way. There is no other way. And he goes, by whom also you have access, or we have access, into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I'm not going to break down all of these real quick because I want to get to a point here. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh what? Patience. Patience, what? It's going to teach me experience. Experience is going to give me hope. Hope make it not a shame to listen. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How? By the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. What keeps the unity among brethren? The Holy Spirit of God. What spirit do I need to be working and walking and operating in? Spirit of the living God. Because he's the one that shed the love of God abroad in different hearts. To bring us together and to unite us. Hear me, church. I, I think it's important. Let me say it a different way. In the tabernacle that they built, there was, there was boards. Stood up. Vertical. And another board stood up next to it. And another board stood up next to it. And another and these boards was wrapped in gold. And them boards, listen to me, represent you, I, the church. The wood represents us in our flesh, and the gold is the divineness of God, that of the spirit in his word that he's given us. We become a new creation in him. But there was rings. Who's, what's going to hold these boards together? And there was rings on the outside. And they would slide a board, a, a pole, a rod down on the outside through the rings. I have to go back and read because I don't remember, but I think there's probably, there was either four or five of them, and I think there was five. And to me, those rings represent what? The apostles and prophets and, and evangelists and pastors and teachers. But that still wasn't going to keep them together. They drilled a hole through them. And through the center of the boards, if my memory corrects me, follow me, they put another rod. And it was all to hold the individual boards together. I believe that rod represents the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit flowing from breast to breast. Moving in your heart and my heart. Teaching us the ways that God wants us to have. That's what brings unity and oneness. Because that's the spirit that God wants us to live in and to abide in. We don't want to be like Peter and James and some of them guys. When, when Jesus sent some people ahead, some of his messengers ahead to one of the Samaritan towns and said, go and prepare for me. And, they, and when he gets there, they wouldn't receive him. What does Peter say? Hey, you guys. Lord, you want us to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did and consume him. And Jesus turned around and said, you don't know what spirit you're from. The church at Corinth got confused to the point they forgot what spirit they was of. 
there was contentions and there was divisions and there was bickering and there was backbiting and there was devouring and there was a, they were separating the body of Christ and one was saying I'm baptized of Paul and another said well Peter baptized me or Apollos or I was baptized into Jesus whatever it was they was creating a division by what they were saying what they was doing We can get, listen, there's a falseness that can get, and the falseness is we get caught up in all of this stuff, whatever that stuff is. How many churches do you know today that have been started because of division in the church? You might want to go be a part of that, but I don't, because they're starting out in the wrong spirit. And to start out in the wrong spirit isn't the best thing to do. I'm not talking about a, a church that is messed up and you get out and, and, and can go uh, be involved in something that is of truth and of God. About people that get angry. You know what? We're going to go start our own church. Where's the blessings? God commands the It's not going to come. Sheds abroad in our hearts. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Back to Psalms 1. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, there the Lord commanded the blessing. Hermon is the loftiest mount or the loftiest peak in the Palestine. There's Palestine, it's right there on the Palestine and Lebanon, overlooking the border cities. It's the loftiest peak in the land of Palestine from its snowy cap. When all the surrounding country is parched, the refreshing dew descends upon the mountains of Zion. And this is one of the figures used by the Holy Ghost to illustrate the beauty and the pleasantness of dwelling together in unity. So we have two illustrations of unity among brethren. It's like the ointment descending from the head of the high priest to the skirts of the garment. And it's like the dew descending in refreshing power from Hermon's snowy top. What does that mean? And what is David trying to describe? Well, if Hermon's the loftiest top, and it's got the snow cap, to, uh, uh, there's a snow cap on the mountains. And from that, the, now listen to the language. The dew descends upon Zion. So the dew is carried from Hermon to the mountains of Zion down in the lower part. And it's refreshing the mountains there, to, uh, the, uh, that refreshing that comes from Mount Hermon. Now, let me just say this. Mount Hermon then, what he's describing is, as Mount Hermon and the dew from Mount Hermon descends upon the mountains of Zion, uh, so the blessings of God and that which comes from the Lord descends upon the body of Christ. Brings refreshing. It brings life. What does do do? It brings life to the vegetation that's there. What is God wanting us to do? He wanting us to understand. I need to get close to where the anointing oil is flowing from. Who does the oil flow from? Exactly. It ain't going to come from no man. So we need to get close to him that we can smell the fragrance of that oil. Let me read you something here. Real quick, a man by the name of Charles McIntosh wrote this. I can't take credit for it, but I thought it was real good. He said, this is the way to dwell in unity with our brethren. It's one thing to talk about unity and another thing altogether to dwell in it. We may profess to hold the unity of the body and the unity of the spirit. Most precious and glorious truth, surely, and all the while be really full 
of selfish strife, party spirit, sectarian feeling, all of which are entirely destructive of practical unity. If brethren are to dwell together in unity, they must be receiving the ointment from the head, the refreshing showers from the true Hermon. They must live in the very presence of Christ so that all their points and angles may be molded off, all their, selfish, all their selfishness judged and subdued, all their own particular notions set aside, all their cues and crotchets flung to the winds. Thus there will be largeness of heart, breadth of mind, depth of sympathy, then we shall learn to bear and forbear. It will not then be loving those who we think are with us and feel, as, uh, feel with us as some pet theory or another. It will be loving and embracing all who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Unity of brethren. Now listen to me, church. What, 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 in order for, God wants us to get close to him because the Holy Spirit flows from Jesus to you. He is our high priest, is he not? And the Holy Spirit, he was anointed with the Spirit of the living God. The Holy Ghost came down upon him and anointed him. And we want, we want the, uh, the oil of his anointing to flow through the body of Christ, that we can be united and be one with him as he is one with the Father. And that is what unity is about. It isn't about me having my way. It isn't about doing things this way or that way. It isn't about any of those things. It is about understanding that we're dealing with people and sometimes people don't always behave right. But we got to be patient and kind and lowliness and forbearing and long-suffering as Jesus has been with us. If he's been that way with me, should I be any less that way with you? Or you with me? Because if we're in the right spirit, those things will be. When the wrong spirit, we begin to move. Then we're going to go give somebody a piece of our Tell them what we do. I'm going to correct this right now. This has got to stop. It can't go on no more. Whatever it is. A lot about attitude and the spirit in which we do things in. Yes, some things have to be dealt with. Some things have to be corrected. But it's about what? What? It's about the spirit in which we operate in. Important to God. Very important to thee. See, I don't know. I come home. But my wife has went through that. I don't know when I'm around the body of Christ, my brothers and sisters, I don't know what. Spiritual. I don't know if you've been sick and fit. I don't know if you're emotionally troubled. Or I don't know if you've had to wage war against the devil. I don't know if somebody just cussed you out and do everything. I don't know what you had. And sometimes, when people have been through things that day, may be short with you, cross with you, own that you. Every one of us. Would want us to up with some things. Those personalities all different. Okay. To be best friends with them and go out and eat with them every night. That's what it means. It means be gentle with it. How we deal. That's what it means means all of those things. That's the spirit that God. You know what? You're part of it. Love of God. I don't know what you're being, what you want. You know what I want? Number one, I want the presence of our Lord and Savior here. 
I want His presence touching it. I want to hear the truth. I want I want to be able to love you, and I want you to be able to. I want to experience the fellowship of the family of people come in, new people or people that's been away for a while and they come back. Maybe they're not quite as connected as you. You got to learn patience. We do, and be kind and long suffering and to be gentle. We got to do our part. Because our part is what? We want to see and do the work of Christ and reaching out to people. So, read you another verse here in Hosea, chapter 14, verse 5 about the dew. I will be as the dew upon Israel. The Lord is saying, I will be the dew. Remember, Herman's dew descended down. He is that he and he Israel shall grow as the lily, cast forth his roots as what a blessing. We go back to Psalm 133. Listen, as the dew of Hermon that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Now listen to what he says. And the Lord commanded the blessing. God can bless this church. Do you believe it? question is, what spirit do we want? we want to walk in a spirit that hinders the blessings of God? Or do we want to walk? That's the spirit of quarreling and pinching and circling and all of that. We want to walk in love and patience and goodness. One spirit. I want to encourage you. I'm not saying anybody here has a wrong spirit. Take it. But I believe that we need to prepare and expect God to bless. You can't deal with nobody but yourself as far as individually between you and the man. Hallelujah. Tell everybody on the line goodbye. Glad that you joined us this morning. I want y'all to sit here just for a minute until she gets out offline. A couple of things I'd like to express to you, our congregation.